uh, another guest to get more uh, on what is happening in Venezuela. Jason Anruje is a political commentator uh, who joins us. Jason Anruje, uh, a call for people to rise, a call for a coup, even though a coup sh should happen on its own. Uh, but uh, at this point, that's what we're looking at when it comes to what is happening in Venezuela. What is your reading into uh, what has happened? I think that this demonstrates that U.S. imperialism is reaching a fever pitch inside the country. Uh, as you previously stated, it's already essentially murdered 40,000 people. This is, frankly, it, legally, it fits the definition of genocide. I think that they're so frustrated with the fact that the Venezuelan people have not rejected uh, Maduro as a leader, as an anti-imperialist stance for the independence of Venezuela, a country that has spent decades under the, the fist of U.S. imperialism, and only in the last 20 have they been relatively free of that. I mean, they've suffered the ill effects of having resisted U.S. imperialism, but they've not been directly under it, its fists, uh, so to speak. I think that the the real situation here is that the United States has lost patience when dealing with trying to overthrow uh, this this government. They've done everything. They have done the sanctions. They have done uh, slandering it in the international arena. It has gone through and done just about every unethical, underhanded, you know, every unethical un underhanded thing except actually you know actually bombing the country or actually carrying out an invasion although it has used proxy forces inside the country to essentially carry out terrorist attacks against it so I, I think this represents uh, a large amount of frustration on the part of the United States because essentially for 20 years they have been trying to do this. Since uh, Hugo Chavez first came to power, the attempt to uh, oust the – or at least cancel the Bolivarian Revolution has been unsuccessful. This is one of the uh, – one of the longest – running failures of the United States, uh, save uh, the Iranian uh, Islamic Revolution. Now, for two decades now, they've been resisting, and the United States has done a lot in those uh, 20 years. And all of it thus far has completely failed. I think that we're seeing something with uh, Trump, that he's uh, doing the imperialism when he essentially, without using the word imperialism, said that he was going to cut back on the wars said that uh, this was not a thing that he wanted to do. But of course, we see that a, a president can say anything he wants, but he is bound to the, the system itself. He still has to say imperialist system, so in order for it to function, it has to act in an imperialist manner. So this is something that is not going to change anytime soon. I don't see the United States ever giving this up. I mean, if, you know, if the... If the Islamic Revolution could be under pressure for 40 years, give or take, then uh, they would certainly do the same thing to Venezuela. You know, they'll go 40 years, 50 years, <laughs> if the U.S. Empire lasts 100 years, they'll continue to pressure Venezuela. But we, we, we do see this inside of a larger context, a massive push by U.S. forces, particularly in Africa where they have a great deal of operations bringing, being carried out by AFRICOM that, you know, generally the, the American public uh, isn't even actually aware of. Uh, we do see the United States acting more aggressively because they do see the rise of China as a rival power, one that is uh, getting very deep into Africa, whereas previously there was uh, a, a few battles back and forth uh, over you know the old colonial powers, etc. But China is gaining a great deal of influence, and as a result of the, this, the U.S. now has to step up operations everywhere in order to prevent a a tipping point to where the empire would begin to fall. Uh, the United States can only maintain its global hegemonic position by the use of force over other countries that's how empire that's how imperialism works it's it's an act of force it's something that has to be violently enforced if you're not doing that you are going to lose it so i, I think that this is all occurring in a particular context which certainly does uh, 
re reflect the greater geopolitical situation in general that the United States is facing. I think it, it can certainly see a tipping point coming soon where it could completely fall and China could completely rise to supplant them as the global superpower. And this uh, fear of, of hitting that tipping point is probably forcing the United States to take a much more violent and aggressive stance towards its usual operations. I mean, you combine that with the fact that in the past 20 years, they have not been able to stop the Bolivar and Revolution. They've been able to cause no end to the amount of human suffering, but no amount of actually being able to, to stop the whole Bolivarian experiment. And I think that this... This is this is really reflective of that. And I think from here on out, because of the increasing boldness of U.S. actions in Venezuela, it's probably going to get very it's going to probably going to get a lot worse sometime soon. Jason Renuha, when you have um, uh, Guaido uh, make the announcement that he did gather some soldiers behind him, call for an uprising, call for Venezuelans to come out on the streets. But yet, hours later, he leaves the scene. Uh, what message does that send? It means that he's willing to just make a, a quick little jab and then run away back to his U.S. paymasters as quickly as possible, most likely hiding out in Colombia. If he is so legitimate and he is so loved, then why is it necessary for him to just, you know, dine and dash like that and essentially not have to really face anybody? This is a photo op. There's nothing more than a politician shooting his mouth off at uh, at some particular event to try to improve his image and then going back to the status quo immediately after. I mean, this is very clearly a propaganda stunt to make it look like the military is on his side when really all he has is a handful of traitors. He knows his actions are criminal, and he knows that he's probably in danger of being arrested sometime soon. Uh, I don't know why he hasn't already. There's certainly enough grounds to to do so. But, I mean, this is, this is really just a, a propaganda op. Uh, get the images of him out there with the military. Spread them around social media as quickly as possible. Try to put the image in the minds of the Venezuelan people that the military is on his side. Put them out into the Western world, you know, spread them across Twitter, Facebook, etc., and give generally the imperialist world the idea that the Venezuelan military is on his side, and that therefore everything that the U.S. has done, the country is somehow justified as a result. See, our support for this guy was completely justified because the Venezuelan people really want him, and now the military really want him. So. Uh, Maduro will be falling sometime soon as a result, although this is this is hollow propaganda. This isn't even uh, you know, a promotion of the truth or anything that's even close to the truth. It's merely just an active show designed to try to sway public opinion, and I would think more so in the Western world to justify the U.S.'s actions to its own people. Don't worry, the the horrendous thing we've done in murdering 40,000 people has all been justified by uh, this piece of uh, photo op right here. Please keep supporting us. Keep thinking that we're doing the right thing when really we're just uh, carrying out the interests of, uh, of big oil and other uh, members of the, the ruling elite. So I, I think that uh, this is a very typical of of someone who is a blatant usurper. It, it's just a, a, a quick a, a t attempt at a show of force and then run back into hiding where he belongs, probably on his way uh, back to Colombia right now while he has his um, his underlings in, still inside Venezuela looking for some kind of um, a position to grab, some kind of ground to hold, to claim some kind of Le, uh, le legitimacy. What we haven't seen from the mainstream media is uh, a footage that I saw maybe about uh, two weeks ago. Uh, Juan Guaido went into what is a, essentially a working class neighborhood inside of Venezuela. You know, the, you know some of the, the lower classes, and attempted to do a photo op. See, everybody loves me, etc. And he was met with. Uh, essentially rocks people were throwing rocks at his limousine 
Uh, they were yelling at him to get out. There were people uh, grabbing cameras and filming themselves, telling him to leave, that he was not wanted there, that they essentially hated him. They hated him enough to throw rocks at his car. So I think that's what happens when Juan Guaido goes out and tries to visit the people of Venezuela. He is not wanted. He, he looks perfectly uh, prim and proper standing around in in front of his uh, lackeys in um, what, essentially traitors in the military standing around being protected. But if he goes down into the people, if he walks into the public and to actually meets the people that he claims to represent – then we see a very, very different story. He is certainly despised by these people enough where they're essentially willing to commit a, a, an assault against him. It was essentially a mob that told him that he wasn't welcome there and that they didn't want him there, and he had to tuck his tail between his legs and run away and go back to uh, oh, wherever it is that he's uh, staying right now. But he uh, certainly is very boisterous and very... Uh, uh, proud and, and very professional in front of his uh, carefully crafted propaganda op. But if he meets the real people of Venezuela, it's certainly a very different story. Okay, Jason and Ruha, we talked about Russia a little bit. Uh, I don't know if you made uh, or were able to make some comments about uh, Russia's role here, but also China, both obviously allied to uh, the Venezuelan um, uh, President uh, Nicolas Maduro. What we have on China is uh, uh, the most recent news of uh, importance that the head of the U.S. Southern Command says Beijing is using disinformation and debt diplomacy uh, to dig in as Maduro clings to power. Uh, do you think that both Russia and China uh, supporting Maduro will uh, change plans for the U.S. or will they, uh, will they just uh, continue with uh, the persistence or insistence on having uh, Maduro fall from power? I think overall the 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 point of all of this remains the same. There must be a removal of uh, not just Maduro but the Bolivarian Revolution in general. But the support of the the Chinese and the Russians is certainly uh, a game changer in the country. Now it was previously reported that troops from Russia are inside Venezuela right now. Some of them uh, showing, um, I believe it was either how to fly certain MiG jets or how to use anti-air guns. I believe it was probably how to use uh, jets that were, I think, recently purchased um, or advisors or something like that. Uh, the actual thing uh, eludes me right now. There are Russian troops inside Venezuela right now. So if the U.S. carries out a, a, a violent military act, an overt one, not uh, something through proxy forces, and Russian troops end up dying, this would very much pull Russia into the entire conflict and would certainly be enough to justify retaliation on part of the on the part of the, of the Russian government, which would add an entire whole new political dimension to this entire situation and that would complicate things a, a great deal uh, i know previously we saw u.s forces end up uh, uh killing russians inside of syria and that was something that irked the russian government greatly i mean of, of, of course it would but i think this would be a little bit of a different situation as it's it's really not a war zone the same way that Syria is right now, where there's, you know, there's constantly, you know, military operations being carried out and, uh, you know, various sides fighting. Think Venezuela is not in you know, a literal state of war, though um, from many of the images we're seeing, you could you could uh, probably uh, you could probably say it at least looks like it's in a state of war, but it's not in like a literal state of war where military forces are firing on other uh, military forces. So I think that there are certain po uh, political implications that do need to be considered. I mean, you don't want to end up dragging a, another nuclear power into this entire conflict, especially one that the United States already has hostilities with, particularly with regards to dumping nuclear treaties that have been going on for decades that had been essentially good in uh, restricting the further development of nuclear weapons, which have also been trashed by the same current U.S. president 
Donald Trump. So I, I think that uh, obviously Venezuela needs the backing of other large, powerful states, just as you know anybody else would need in uh, this kind of situation. But this certainly does add a new dimension to it because of the threat of bringing another uh, major power into into the whole situation. And that's something that the United States doesn't want. They just want to have the current government overthrown. They don't want to have to deal with having uh, to deal with other states now being uh, a, a part of this, which would would definitely happen if uh, any Russian troops were killed in some kind of military endeavor by the United States. And that would be something that would uh, take this to a, a much broader to a, a much broader scope and would involve the UN Security Council much more when one of the members sitting on it is essentially attacked by another and that would that would create uh, a, a great upheaval inside the UN Security Council so I think that is something the United States would like to avoid just get rid of the the current Bolivarian government while trying to minimize any any loss of uh, foreigners or particularly military ones inside the country. We are not looking at this expanding in its um, uh, the energy that was put in behind these uh, people who were throwing rocks at some of the uh, security personnel or security forces. It just looks like it's somewhat fizzled out that we saw the max or the peak of it. Um, even uh, live images from certain other media outlets uh, have stopped because there's not really much happening. People are just kind of congregating and looking around. Even the ones who were throwing stones, you don't even see much of that happening. Um, Jason and Ruhe, uh, the uh, calls made by the U.S. on this is very evident online, especially uh, U.S. Congressman Mark Rubio leading the way when it comes to the tweets on this, uh, asking for, obviously, Venezuelans and others to... Uh, uh, heed the call of uh, Juan Guaido. Uh, th the U.S. has been very vocal about how it wants a Maduro out of power. Uh, if if they are going to continue with this, they are, need to deal with Russia and with China. How are they going to uh, deal with those two who are allied so much with uh, Maduro? Well, I think that's a very complicated situation. I mean, let's be let's just face it. China needs the United States as an economy to export to, and the United States needs China as a country to import from. So I think that's a, it's a it's a very difficult situation for them to de to deal with. They essentially have to. It's 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 a difficult one already. There's uh, fairly fairly decent sanctions already on or pardon me tariffs that the United States have placed on on China, in order to forward their own interests, in order to bully China into uh, a bit better trade deals, etc. I don't know what else they could do to China in the economic realm that would not undermine themselves already any further. I mean, already, you know, the United States has had to put out, I believe it was uh, $12 billion to, to help the, the farmers, uh, the soybean farmers in the United States that have already been harmed by their own tariffs uh, against the Chinese and refusing to export to them, etc. So I, I think it's 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 a difficult question to 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 answer. I mean, there's already the hostilities right there. There are already tariffs on them, tariffs on Russia, uh, tariffs on uh, the EU, which are you know uh, traditionally been an, an ally. I think that it's uh, it, it's. It's it's very strange that the game that the United States is playing here. It's like they've already pushed their their hand to a certain degree. Like there's only so far that you can take uh, certain measures before they have to become overt military ones. Uh, I sincerely doubt that there's going to be any kind of military conflict between the United States uh, with China and Russia in this situation because that would spark off something that would be utterly massive that the United States is not prepared for and certainly does not want and then something that neither Russia nor China uh, really want to deal with a a at all I think that the best the United States could do would be to try to undermine 
you know Chinese and Russian interests in other in other realms, not just in Venezuela itself. It, it's a it's a it's a very difficult situation to deal with. For you know for some time now, the United States has stood as a sole hegemonic global superpower, where nobody had any ability to uh, defy them. Now we have places like Russia and China which can defy them. They can't uh, usurp the United States. Uh, they can't destroy the United States, but they can undermine them to a certain degree and can maintain their own autonomy outside of uh, crushing U.S. influence. And, and that's something that's a little bit different than what we've seen from, you know, at, at least since the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union. And this makes things a, a, a very, a, a very, very tough, tough to deal with. I, I really don't know what the United States could do to Russia or China in this regard, but I'm certain that they would like to minimize any impact on those two countries in this situation. Well, because you know, as we've seen, this is, this is not turning into the full blown. You know, counter revolution that the United States was looking for. We can see from the images that the, the crowds are dwindling a bit. Uh, they're running from uh, gas canisters, but this is this is hardly the the street violence that uh, the United States was looking for. I mean, this is a couple of people throwing rocks over a fence. I mean, despite the the, the numbers out there, there's only a handful that are actually, you know, really doing anything back, like anything that would be considered violence. So, I mean, I've seen, you know, flash mobs that have lasted longer than this. So it's, it's, it's really a difficult situation for me to say in general.